one. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to start with a, uh, uh, a case history uh, at Pointe du Hoc in France. And then uh, we'll continue our discussion on the sheer strength of soils. So let me turn off the lights, and then we'll look at the screen. So we're going to France, and uh, you see, uh, sorry, here the uh, we're at the locate. Sorry, the right here at the location of the uh, D-Day invasion, and you see Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, and so on. And there's a place right here called Pointe du Hoc, where you had some large cliffs. Um, these are the credits. Uh, I worked with uh, Congressman Chad Edwards and Professor Bob Warden, Professor Mark Everett at Texas a and University on this project. There is uh, quite a bit of history behind that project, and it was really exciting for me to be part of uh, this project. So here is Pointe du Hoc. You can see uh, there is major cliffs. That height right here is about uh, 30 meters or 100 foot. Uh, right here is the observation post where the Germans were looking out at sea to see if there were invasions, and then they had some uh, cannons uh, right here uh, that were uh, stationed to uh, shoot at the ships uh, coming in. Uh, so we're back in 1944, and there's a series of heavy bombardments at uh, Pointe du Hoc and other locations uh, along the Normandy coast. Uh, and of course, here's uh, the, the bombardment is relatively random, and then four, five, six, and the uh, D day is 6 June 1944. Uh, you can see right here that uh, the bombs uh, created significant craters all over the uh, land on Pointe du Hoc, including in the, uh, on the beach. And some of them fell on the, uh, on, on the cliff, the cliff edge, and that created uh, an easier access uh, for the ranchers that uh, uh, came in. And, and General Earl Rudder, uh, who later became uh, president of Texas a and University and had a huge impact on the progress of, uh, of our university. General Earl Rudder and 225 ranchers uh, climbed those cliffs. I can tell you that and only about 90 survived uh, and, and made it to, to the top of those cliffs. I was asked to come and help. I'll describe the problem in a minute. Uh, but you can imagine that it was a very special project for me, uh, being an American and being born in France, to see these, uh, to think of these young people, the age of my son, that would be uh, ready to sacrifice their lives uh, to come, essentially to come and deliver my parents. So it was uh, indeed very special. So the problem was that uh, there, the observation post right here was about to fall into the sea because of the erosion of the cliffs and the retreat of these cliffs as a function of time. You can see here the, in cross section, here is the observation post right here and the cliff that's about uh, 30 meters high and then you have some big caverns at the bottom and these overhangs of rock would fall in every 10 years or so and so there was significant retreat of the, of the face of the cliff and the observation post was about to fall into the sea and the Americans wanted to preserve that uh, historical monument uh, working with the, uh, with the French. So here is the, uh, you can see the observation post right here. This is a, a, a granite column uh, memorial to Earl Rudder and his ranchers that was uh, uh, dedicated, I think, 50 years later by President Reagan. Here is the, uh, the, the issue that, that creates this erosion at the bottom of the cliffs. 
Uh, number one, here's the wave height. You can see the significant height of those waves uh, during the season, varying from three meters to five or even six meters high. So these are very large waves during storms. And you add to this the tide, uh, which also can reach six or seven meters at high tide. So imagine that you have a high tide and a significant wave. The water can attack those cliffs significantly. And so here is the level. You see the cliff. That cliff is very tall. Here is low tide, high tide, high tide plus storm surge wave. So it can really pound the rock and we'll see how that actually erodes. So we went to the site and we uh, collected the rock samples that we brought back to Texas A&M University for testing. We ran a number of, so here are the soil cores at the top of the uh, below the ground surface, you have a silty clay uh, for a certain distance, then we have limestone and then uh, uh, sandstone uh, below that. And you can see what's amazing when you have a cliff in front of you is that you can really see the stratigraphy of the, of the material and, and you can simply uh, take a picture and identify uh, each one of the, of the rock layers or soil layers. Uh, so that, that's how we, so you see the silty clay, here is the observation pose, uh, the sea, uh, uh, silty clay, limestone, sandstone, limestone and sandstone, and then a gray marley limestone underlying the, the, the whole thing. Uh, you can see here the, the, the caverns uh, at the bottom of the uh, observation pose on the other side of the point. Here is some more cavern. And uh, I'm standing here, not a very good idea to stand underneath this, but nevertheless, that's for scale. And then uh, you can see that the bottom of the cliffs, uh, there are elements, big elements of rocks that are, uh, the rock is being cracked by the movement of the earth crusts. Uh, and the fissures are then cleaned up by the water. And then these blocks can be more easily moved uh, when there is a big storm at high tide. So we did some modeling uh, uh, in hydrodynamics to explain how these uh, high tides and waves could actually move those, those rocks. And the amazing part is that the erosion, uh, you can see here June 2006 and March 2008. What's the difference? Well, here you have a huge amount of gravel that's been deposited on the beach. And here, the gravel is completely gone. There's been a big storm, and the water has actually eroded all the gravel. So tremendous power of erosion of, that, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the water in this case. So we also did some uh, finite element analysis. Uh, you can see the cliff is right here. There is a big cavern at the bottom. And we were looking for the stresses that were developed in the rock mats. And we showed what those stresses were and essentially demonstrated that the rock was not strong enough. By the time the cliff became about four, the uh, cavern became about four meters deep, then the rock was not strong enough to uh, sustain its own weight in cantilever. Uh, and here are some examples. You can see the size of uh, the people here. And here is an example of a huge failure that uh, took place. So our solution to the problem was to twofold, uh, was to place the observation post on micro piles. So we anchored this uh, post right there and to backfill the cavern. So we had, uh, if you wish, a redundancy in the solution so that if, if one did not work, then the other one uh, could work. And that allowed us to uh, feel pretty uh, secure uh, and, and comfortable with the solution we were proposing. And I, I remember, uh, so I would have regular meetings with the, with the, uh, you know, the hierarchy of the project. And uh, General Hawkins was in, uh, 
in uh, Paris, and uh, he asked me, he said, well, you know, you're proposing this fancy stuff here, how sure are you that it's going to work? And I said, well, you know, the probability is probably around 10 to minus 3, so he said, no, wait a minute, no, tell me, <laughs> tell me, <laughs> in real words, what, uh, what that means. And so I finally said, look, I have two children, and I wouldn't mind putting my two children in the observation post for the next 50 years once that solution is in place. You say, good, now you convince me. <laughs> and, and so we did this, and, uh, and here is the, and it had to be aesthetic, because the French were pretty particular about making sure that, uh, you know, whatever was done should be uh, blending into the scenery. And so you see that, that this used to be a cavern, and it has been backfilled with rocks uh, from the beach that uh, resemble, and, and everything was done in a very uh, elegant way. And then finally, we, uh, we uh, solved that problem. And then the, uh, the because the observation posts had been closed uh, when it became too dangerous for the public to come and visit uh, Point du Hoc, and uh, so finally, after all this repair work, the, uh, the, it was, the observation post was reopened and actually this, uh, this uh, ceremony is right on the top of the observation post by the uh, uh, Rudder uh, Memorial Column. And it was quite a, quite a big deal. This is John Kerry. At the time, John Kerry was uh, Secretary of State. Uh, and here we are with, uh, with uh, uh, Chet Edwards, right here, Congressman uh, uh, Chet Edwards and uh, uh, the, the two uh, daughters of uh, Earl Brothers. So this, this was another example of a great, uh, great cooperation between uh, the United States and, uh, and France. So again, very special project. Uh, let me now get the lights back on, and then we'll get back on the shift strength. All right, so <clears throat> last time I talked about uh, shear strength, and I told you, I showed you how the uh, the major equation, uh, which is S equals C plus sigma minus alpha UW times tangent phi. Okay, where S is the shear strength. of the soil, C is the effective stress cohesion, sigma is the total normal stress, and remember the one that I told you we're going to forget, on the plane of failure, on the plane of failure. Uh, alpha is the water area ratio. And UW is the water stress, often called pore pressure. And then phi uh, is the effect of stress, friction angle. With tangent phi being essentially the uh, coefficient of friction. And I mentioned to you that C is a relatively small part of this uh, shear strength in, in most cases, except for some uh, heavily overconsolidated materials. So basically, this is the bigger part 
uh, that uh, uh, shear strength and, and uh, in a nutshell, soils are uh, by and large frictional material. They resist, at least in shear strength, resist by, uh, by resistance uh, through friction. Very important equation. Uh, make sure you remember it. It's going to be on the final. Now, I want to do the first thing I want to do is a uh, uh, problem, uh, and we'll start with problem 15.2 on page 465. So, 15.2 says a medium dense sand deposit as a dry unit weight. So, we have <coughs> So this is problem 15.2. Uh, sand. Deposit has a unit weight, a dry unit weight, so gamma dry equals 17 kilonewton per cubic meter. This black pen doesn't work very well, does it? Get back to blue. So this is ground surface, and uh, what else do we have? Saturated unit weight, gamma saturated is twenty kilonewton per cubic meter. Friction angle thirty-two degrees. Calculate the shear strength. So the question is shear strength on a horizontal plane. Um, at a depth of 10 meters. At Z equal 10 meters. So you have the ground surface right here. And then 10 meter below. 10 meter. You have, you consider a horizontal plane, and you want to know what the shear strength of the soil is on that horizontal plane. So to solve that problem, we have to uh, write this equation. We say S equal C. Cohesion, it says sand right here. So sand has no cohesion. So that means zero plus sigma total vertical stress. So it's uh, sigma is this way because the plane of failure has been chosen as the horizontal plane. So the normal total stress on the plane of failure is perpendicular, so it's a vertical stress. And so sigma at 10 meters uh, is. Now it says in the first case, the groundwater level is much deeper than 10 meter and the sand has no water. Okay, so in the first case, the water level is deep and there is no water. So that means that I've got to use gamma dry or 17 times 10. And then minus alpha UW zero because there's no water. Tangent 32 degrees because that's the, uh, that's the uh, friction angle. So I did that and I got 106.2. 106.2 kilopascal. All right? First case. Sec so that was when the, when the water level, the level, the water level was way deeper. Okay? That was case A. And then second case, the ground, the ground water level is at the ground surface. So B, the water level rises to the ground surface. So in the case of B, I got to calculate the shear strength again. No cohesion, zero, plus the water has gone up all the way to the ground surface, so the material is saturated, they're going to have to use gamma saturated. So I do 20 times 10 minus 
Alpha is the area ratio. Well, the whole thing is saturated, so the area ratio is 1 times the water stress. Water stress 10 meters down is hydrostatic stress 10 times, and we're going to use 10 for the unit weight of water. Tangent 32 degrees. Okay? So I did that, and I got S equal. Uh, I, I actually use 9.81 in there. 63.7 kilopascal. So first thing you see is that when the water rises, the shear strength decreases. And the reason for this is that the, the grains are not as heavy because there is buoyancy force. And because they're not as heavy, the friction is less, and therefore the shear strength is less. So every time you have, and when you, when you do design, it's a good idea to consider that your water level is as, as high as you think it might ever get, so that you have a conservative estimate of the shear strength. C, third case, it says the ground water level is at 12 meters, and the sand is saturated by capillary action. So we're back to having the water level here at 12 meters, so below the plane where we are, but the, uh, uh, the material here is saturated by capillary action. So again, I do S equal zero. No cohesion. And then I have to calculate the vertical total stress at 10 meters, the plane of failure. The material is saturated by cap reaction, so I've got to use 20 times 10 minus area ratio. Again, saturated by cap reaction, therefore the degree of saturation is 1 and alpha is equal to 1 times. The water stress. So the water stress is zero right here because we're on the level of the groundwater level. And if I plot, in this case, it's getting a bit complicated here, but you have hydrostatic stress below the groundwater level, and then the capillary reaction creates a negative stress all the way up to the ground surface, so that by the time I'm looking for what's happening, uh, this distance here is two meters, because this is 10, and this right here for the third part of the problem was 12 meters. So I've got two meter difference between this level and this level where I'm calculating the shear strength, and therefore it's minus two minus 2 times 10. So minus 2 times 10. Times tangent 32 degrees. So I did that and I found uh, 137.2. 137.2 kPa. And now you see that when I compare this to this, when the water level goes down, and especially if the water goes into tension, as it does right here, then the shear strength increases. So no water, dry case, water rises to the top, and then water goes down, but the material stays saturated uh, by capillary action. So this is uh, one problem I wanted to go through with you. The second one is kind of a fun problem that uh, this is problem 15 one. So let's do 15 one. Problem 15 one. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, a fan of Formula One. I love race cars, uh, I, uh, I, uh, that goes back a ways when I was a student. Uh, but, uh, and my wife Janet says, uh, because I buy, uh, you know, sports cars, 
and my wife says, uh, you'll never grow up. <laughs> I respond, I hope so. <laughs> anyway, so uh, th here's the problem. Uh, you know that if you want to take a corner with a car as fast as you can, you want some big fat tires on the ground, right? Uh, bicycle tires, you know, are not going to do too well. But let's think about it for a minute. So here's a, a first car. <clears throat> And this car is on bicycle tires, okay? And then here is the same car, same weight, but this car is on big fat tires, okay? They're both on the ground. And you have to choose a car to take the corner as fast as you can so you can beat the other guy. So you, you know, from common sense, you say, well, I'll take this one, and you would be right. But the question is, why? Let's look at it this way, all right? You have this car weighs W, and this car weighs W, okay? And if you take the corner, there's going to be a shear uh, on the tires, and what you're looking for is the shear strength of the tires because it, uh, that, that would be the limiting condition if you exceed the shear strength of the interface between the rubber and the asphalt, then you go into the ditch. So if you believe that this uh, force here that you can generate is F equals mu times W, that's the weight W, and here F is equal to mu times W, the coefficient of friction is the same because here you have rubber and asphalt, rubber and asphalt, so it doesn't make any difference. The area of the tire doesn't make any difference, okay? So I'm tricking you because obviously there's something wrong with my reasoning, but I wanted to at least show it to you. So what is, why is it true that the big tires are better than the bicycle tires? Well, as I said, I tricked you here because and this is related to uh, shear strength of soil, is because that equation has a C in it. Right here you have a C. And this C value depends on the area. This C value depends on the area. Big flat tire of a much bigger C than the small bicycle tires. Okay? So, uh, even when you, when you think of Formula One, this equation holds true, uh, and, and you have to, uh, and, this, and uh, obviously there's a lot of C in, uh, in the interface, and that's why people want these soft, uh, soft compound uh, rubber tires, because they have huge C value. They don't last very long, uh, as long as the hard uh, rubber tire, because you know, the hard rubber tire can have lower C, but lasts a lot longer. Anyway, so enough of that. Let me start now to talk about uh, how do we measure this uh, soil shear strength. I'll leave the equation here. But let's look at some of the soil testing that we do. Uh, to be able to measure, because these are very important uh, input to a lot of the design that we do. This controls the strength of the material, this controls bearing capacity of building, this controls uh, stability of slope, uh, stability of excavations, uh, a lot of uh, impact on many, many things that, that we do. So the first test uh, that I'm going to cover is the direct shear test. So direct shear test is a test where we take a sample of soil. This, this is about a full scale, so it's about uh, 
75 millimeter in diameter and about uh, 30 millimeters high. And then we apply a vertical stress sigma. Uh, we place um, this sample into a box that is split. So you have the top of the box and the bottom of the box. And this is on the rollers, basically. And then we push on the bottom of the box in one direction, and we hold the other side so that we force the sample to fail along a predetermined failure plane. So this is the failure plane. So this will be related to, so basically what we, uh, so we have a force here uh, that leads to the shear tau. And this thing deflects uh, and gets into a position where this is right here. And this, uh, well, sorry, uh, I put it in the wrong direction. Let me correct this. So I have the top of the box here. I'm moving the bottom of the box. I'm holding the top of the box. So the bottom of the box will move over here. I'll exaggerate to be able to show you. And you have a movement here, which is delta y. And I run the test in such a way that, let me see if this works here. I run the test such that uh, I'm going to measure tau, and I'm going to plot it versus delta y. So the curve, as I, you know, first I play sigma, then I start pushing. And the curve, the stress, the shear stress increases, increases, and then reaches a maximum. So that the shear strength, the S value here, is reached at that point. So this is going to be S. And this S corresponds to this sigma. Because if I increase sigma, I want to increase that value of S according to this equation, you know, basic uh, friction phenomena. So that's what we do. And we have essentially uh, two choices. We can, uh, in, in this test, we do not, UW typically is not measured. Okay, the, the, it's, it's a relatively simple test, and so the, the uh, equipment is again simple and not very expensive. The test is fairly rapid, very useful, but we don't measure the water stress. So that means that uh, we have two choices. We can either do the test drain, which means that we go very slowly so that the water stress doesn't have time to rise. So in this case, u, w equals zero. And then we can know the effective stress because then sigma is equal to sigma prime since u, w is equal to zero. So if we want some uh, to be able to evaluate c and phi in a direct shift test, we're going to have to do it in such a way that we control the water pressure at equal to zero. And, and uh, that's one tip. The other case is to do it undrained. And if it's not undrained, that means quickly, you know, we do the test in about 10 minutes. Uh, then in this case, UW is unknown. And we simply get what we call the undrained shear strength. And we'll discuss later, we'll see that this undrained shear strength can actually be quite valuable. In other words, we cannot get the C 
and phi value, but we can get the S sub u, and this S sub u will turn out to be quite useful. For example, um, if, you, if you place uh, a foundation on top of a clay, when you place the foundation and this clay is full of water, the water is going to go in compression, right? It, 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 uh, the water is pressurized and doesn't have time to drain because it's difficult to drain if the pores are quite small. Um, and in this case, you find yourself in an undrained situation. And it turns out that often that controls the design. As the water drains, the water pressure decreases, the effective stress increases, the strength increases, things get better with time. So this undrained shear strength uh, tends to control a number of things that we do when we design uh, uh, structures on silt and on clay. In sand and in gravel, the drainage is relatively fast and if it takes you know, one year to construct something, well, by the end of construction, you probably have drainage that's taken place, whereas drainage may take years in silts and clays, so that even at the end of construction, you still have some water pressure trapped uh, in the pores. So these are the, the two uh, different, uh, different uh, type of tests. All right, let me move to problem 1916 page 229. So I go to page 229. 229. All right. It's a problem on the, on the direct shear test. Uh, it says two direct shear tests are performed on a sample of saturated clay. So saturated clay already is an important. Um, so two direct shear tests, uh, and it says saturated clay. Uh, so again, this is problem nineteen sixteen. Saturated clay, what else do we have? The tests are slow tests, such as the water stress remains equal to zero. So that's, again, very helpful. UW equals zero, drain test. Uh, test number one. So test number one, we have some data here. Test one, the normal uh, this is equal to N divided by the area and it says that the normal load on the test on the sample is 300 Newton. Uh, the shear force is 250 Newtons. So shear force is this one here, shear force divided by area. What else do we have? The area, 0.01 meter square. Degree of saturation is 100%. And as we stated, U is equal to zero. And then test number two, we have N equal 600, T equal 400, A is the same, we still have a saturated soil and a drain test so that we don't have any water pressure. Okay, so this is the statement of the uh, of the problem. <clears throat> so we need to find, the question is, find the C and phi of the soil. Okay, typical test results. And so we calculate 
uh, for test one, we will have sigma prime equals 300, and we'll do it in kilopascal. So I need 300 divided uh, times 10 minus 3 to be in kilonewton, divided by the area, 0 0.01 uh, square meter. So this is uh, 30, right? No more force. Uh, where am I? Shear force, yes, sigma prime. So we have 30 kPa. Uh, the shear strength is equal to 250 times 10 minus 3 divided by the area 0 0.01 equals 25 kPa. For test two, I repeat all this, sigma prime is equal to 600 times 10 to minus 3 divided by 0 0.01 equals 60 kPa. And then S is going to be equal to 400 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 0 0.01 equals 40 kPa. So now I have the results at failure for those two um, direct shear tests. And I can go here and plot the, the results on the uh, shear versus effective stress set of axes. This is the set of axes where later on we'll talk about more circle transle testing. So this is going to be a picture that you will see for a little while <coughs> to come. Now, first of all, in this set of axes, uh, you have to make sure, uh, let's see, S is going to be 25 and 40, and this is going to be 30 and 60. So I need to have a scale that goes from 0 to maybe 50, OK, 30, 40, 50. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, okay? And I must have, this is important, I must have the same scale on this axis. The reason you want the same scale is because if you don't have a same scale, you will not have a more circle. You'll have a more banana or a more potato or I don't know what it is, but you won't have a more circle. So make sure that you get the same um, uh, scale on, on both sides, okay? So this is sigma prime in kPa, and this is tau in uh, kPa as well. Now, the results of the first test says that the shear strength was 25 when the effective normal stress on the plane of failure was 30. So that means that I get 25 and 30. So that's the result at failure for test one. The results for test two is sigma prime of 60 and S of 40. So when I go to 40, I go to 60. And here is the result of the second test. Both of these tests are on the failure envelope and I can join those two quantities, those two points, and that straight line, the green line, gives you the friction angle and the cohesion intercept, effective stress cohesion, effective stress because we plotted this against effective stress. Why did we need two tests? If I imagine that I didn't give you the second test here, you have one point, 
but you don't know where to put the straight line because you have two unknowns, C and phi, and one piece of data. So that's why in the general case, uh, you will need to, at least two points. Uh, sometimes we do more than two tests, but you need at least two, two points so that you can put the straight line and then both get defined both C and phi uh, in this case. And, and uh, basically, you, uh, I mean, you can find the equation by using those two pieces of data, or you can simply use graph paper and read your C value here and, uh, and phi uh, value right here. So, you know, uh, for the final, you will need the graph paper. Uh, you will need a, a straight edge. You will probably need a compass for the, uh, the more circle. And, and so it's equipment intensive. Uh, but that's how it goes. All right, so this direct shear test is very convenient, uh, relatively quick, and uh, quite useful. It has limitations, and the limitations is that if you recall the, the, the yeah, if you recall the curve that we get from this test, then here we have the movement. We don't have the shear strain. So this curve here, uh, from which I get the shear strength S, this curve does not give me, so it gives the shear strength but not the modulus of deformation. And that's a limitation of the of the test. In order to uh, solve this limitation, people developed after the development of the direct shear test, developed another test that I want to mention to you, uh, and that's the simple shear test. Or simple direct shear test. In this test, the material, uh, you still have the same uh, type of sample, which is like this. But instead of a split steel box on the outside, you have uh, steel rings, or it can be a membrane. And then the material is sheared by applying, of course, you put sigma, as always. And then you, put, you apply your shear this way, your shear that way. And the material deforms in this fashion, it deforms uniformly. And so this is the delta y that we were getting <coughs> from the direct shear test. But now the element is deforming uniformly in shear. And if this is the height of the element, h, then gamma, for small strain definition, uh, gamma is going to be delta y over H, and I'm measuring tau, so now I can pre uh, prepare the curve tau versus gamma, and then when I, when I uh, draw the curve of uh, tau versus gamma, then I can get that slope here, which will be the shear modulus of the surface. So that, that's one advantage. The, the, the equipment is more complicated, not as common, uh, but it does solve this limitation of the, uh, of the direct shear test. Uh, we can get the modulus information also from the other test that I will talk about next time, which is the triaxial test. So when we talk about the triaxial test, the next lecture will introduce also the Morse circle and a number of things that, uh, uh, that I will talk to you next time.